So welcome everyone to lecture number 24. And today we start discussing about precambrian tectonics, which is uh, or precambrian geology. Well, um, we won't discuss only about tectonics. Actually, next time we'll focus more on the tectonics and today we'll discuss about the geology. Um, I think it is very interesting and uh, I, I think that you will find it very interesting as well. And uh, I can tell you that if any of you is interested in, in uh, tectonics, uh, if you want to leave your mark and uh, bring your contribution, there is plenty of work to do in Precambrian tectonics, actually, and you'll see why. Um, so, as you can see, we'll discuss about the geologic time scale and we'll discuss a bit about cratons. Uh, I, I mentioned this when we discussed about the structure um, of the planet, um, but we have to uh, uh, remember what exactly they are. And uh, then we'll, we'll see the differences between Archean geology and Proterozoic geology, and we'll end with a discussion on the on some changes through time of important aspects such as heat production, evolution of the um, increase in temperature. This is what crusts are geotherms through the crust through time and uh, uh, the growth of continental crust through time. And you, uh, uh, you'll see why it is important in discussing these aspects. But I'm, I'm going to start with that's why I said it's more of a geological talk, not only tectonic talk. It's a geological talk, so it's even more complete. Yeah, I'm going to start with the geologic time scale, and I'm pretty sure at some point in the classes you have taken so far, um, maybe in the general geology and geosciences, uh, geologia general, or maybe with uh, uh, my colleagues Leslie uh, in paleontologia or with um, or uh, we don't know in uh, stratigraphia, uh, you definitely must have seen the geologic time scale. And uh, with Leslie and with Forhe, when you discuss paleontology and stratigraphy, you will be focusing, or you have focused already, on these three parts, yeah, uh, on 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 these uh, eras uh, of of an eon. An eon is a very long period of time, yeah. And it com comprises uh, three eras, and we call them Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And you see how they are segmented these time periods into smaller and smaller periods, in into periods and epochs and ages and so on. Now, probably with uh, Leslie and um, Jorge, you mu must have had to this thing as a as a bit of a challenge to learn maybe the periods, yeah, to learn the periods of the Paleozoic, Mesozoic. Cenozoic. And the first period of the Paleozoic, so the oldest one, we call it Cambrian. And uh, Cambrian is famous for um, the apparition uh, of, uh, you know, life in, in different forms and so on. But what was before Cambrian, people called it Precambrian. Precambrian. So it's before Cambrian. So that's why we have something that, uh, that is called Precambrian. Now, when you look at this geologic time scale, and I, I apologize if I stay too much on this, and maybe uh, you might find it boring, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where I want to get. When you look at this, everything is equal. Yeah, everything you see these rectangles, or they all of them are equal. All of them have the same font. So basically, you think, okay, so we have Precambrian, we have Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, Mesozoic with the dinosaurs. Cenozoic with the humans and uh, mammy, uh, mammals and all this. Okay, that's very nice. But what about Precambrian? In these disciplines, which are the historic disciplines in geology, like paleontology, the strategy, stratigraph, the historical geology, a lot of focus uh, goes into Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. But what is Precambrian? So basically, we call the first three, this Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic that you see here, Phanerozoic Eon. Now, is Precambrian an eon? Well, we call it a super eon. So it's more than an eon. And here is, and I, I want to, you to, to think about deep time. So deep time is something that we definitely cannot conceive it uh, only in an abstract manner. 
And I wanted to illustrate here with a little quote from a very old, very one of the oldest creations of the uh, human mind, philosophical creations of the human mind. Um, uh, these um, Vedas that come from the Hindu culture. And the Vedas are very old, yeah, some of the uh, earliest uh, writings. And if you read this quote, you see how you, the Indian philosophers, they realize that we have to contemplate deep time. And they say that basically they don't know where the creation comes from, but they, they were aware that the gods are later than this world's formation, which in my opinion is very nice the way they put it, yeah? Who then can know the origins of the world? So it is very philosophical, but we as geo geoscientists, we have to consider this aspect. And when we look at the Precambrian, you see here three eons. Yes, Gabriel. Three eons are the Hadean, which is before more than 4 billion years old, the Archean and the Proterozoic. Now, you already read this, and if you look at the whole history of the planet, and you divide it into eight parts, seven of these eight parts belong to Precambrian. So you as students of geology, you focus on one eight, a lot, on one eight of our planet's history. And in my opinion, the uh, geological education in not in this department, in many departments, is biased towards this one eight, which is, it doesn't make sense, but it comes from a historic fact, from the fact that the development of the geological sciences uh, was linked to the study of fossils and of uh, recent layers, yeah, uh, sedimentary layers, and the focus went there. Nowadays, many researchers uh, dedicate their careers to uh, Precambrian geology, which is quite intriguing and amazing in my opinion. So you'll see. So let's start the, uh, this story, yeah. Uh, you remember this picture, I, I, this uh, image, I've shown you that the continents actually have a core. And this core, we, we uh, call them cratons, yeah? We call them cratons, and you see the uh, South American craton here, you see it uh, with green and red, the North American. Now, the cratons, we divide them into the parts that are exposed, so we can see these old rocks and uh, we call them shields, like the Guyana shield here, yeah? But the, the actual rocks that they then extend, they extend, uh, and they are uh, underneath younger sedimentary layers, younger than one billion years. And we call these regions like platforms, yeah? But if you drill through these sedimentary la layers, younger, you get to this, Precambrian basement. So when we talk about these uh, cratonic uh, rocks that are in the cratons, they are rocks that formed, formed, and uh, were deformed after their formation uh, during the Precambrian. And you see how big a part of the continents actually has such at least a basement if it is not exposed. So that's why now you can. Imagine you as a geoscientist, if you look at this map, you'll say, well, it makes sense to dedicate for more many people to dedicate their thinking, to dedicate their efforts to understanding such a big part of the continents, as opposed to the younger parts. Not that the younger parts are not interesting, they are very interesting, and we, we've seen in the recent orogenic belts. But that's why I am saying that it's not, it is a biased education, yeah? when I'm saying in terms of the geological education, I'm trying to correct a bit the balance so that you, you are a bit prepared. That's the idea. So if you remember, these are, uh, this is a text that you have seen already when we discussed about the structure of the earth and we talked about the shields and the platforms and what happens here, yeah? Uh, so I'm not gonna uh, stay too long here. All right, now let's go to the Archean. So the Archean period, so I said that we have three eons. So we have 
IDN, we have Archean, and we have Proterozoic. Now, 4 billion years, so between 4.6 billion years and uh, 4 billion years is the Hadean. It's in fact 4.54, yeah? And from 2.5 to 0 0.5, yeah, uh, is the Proterozoic, a very long eon, 2 billion years. Now, between 4 and 2.5, it's, it's the Archean. And here, um, actually defined as a period containing the earliest rock record on Earth. Now, you'll see the actually the early, really earliest rock record that we have is it comes from Hadean, but people don't talk too much about Hadean. Most of the rocks that we have, uh, oldest rocks, come from the Archean period. So, Peter, I have a question here. Uh, I have, why are they? Uh, so, Gab Gabriel, you ask a question and David asks a question because, David, I, I couldn't really focus and read it. So, Gabriel. Okay, so yes. Um, uh, why, if the Archean period is defined as the period uh, that contains the earliest rock record on the Earth, uh, so uh, does it mean that uh, 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 all records from the ADN period or destroyed or or, yes. or lost? Yes, they were destroyed uh, to a large part. So we don't really know to what extent that it was a solid, uh, you know, uh, we had a solid surface to uh, have preservation of these rocks. Also, they were destroyed, definitely. Uh, there is a bit of a rock record. I'm going to show it in a bit. but. We, from this time period, the transformation and the formation of the actual solid rocks as we know them come, you know, uh, come from a bit later. So, yeah, that's that's the reason we don't have it. Now, uh, David, I haven't forgotten about you just to, to tell you a little anecdote. I took a course when I was a grad student in Toronto. I took a course in isotope geochemistry with uh, very good researcher uh, and at that time he was uh, working at the royal ontario museum in uh, toronto and um, his name is yuri amelin and then he went to uh, be a professor in hawaii and i think now he is probably with the uh, national university in canberra in australia i think but a very good researcher a very good geochemist looking at various uh, isotope systems and, and i was taking this course with him and uh, he was wearing a white coat, yeah, because he was working in this lab, the isotope lab in this museum, and I was going to the lab. And um, well, after I met him, I think the first time or when we had the chat and we were discussing, and uh, because he was dating very old things, very old rocks, and uh, I asked him, I said, well, what is the oldest object that we have here on Earth. <laughs> That's what I asked him, yeah, the, the oldest object that we, we have, object in the sense, not object created by man, but like natural object. And he had this coat, this white coat, and he had the pocket yeah, on each side. So he got his hand into his pocket and he got something out of it and he said, this is. And he gave me this piece of rock. And I was looking at it and she said, yeah, this is the oldest thing that we have. And I said, what is this? And he said, well, this is a piece of the Agenda meteorite. So it, it, it was not from planet, it came as a meteorite. And he said, this is 4.6 billion years old. It is older than the planet. So it was kind of amazing, yeah? So I was thinking, okay, well, I look at this rock, it's actually older than, the planet itself, and he was carrying this in his pocket because he's a researcher, yeah, and he did these things and so on. So it was kind of fun, yeah. So the idea is that we are impressed by this. Now, uh, I, I want to give David the chance to ask again his question. Sorry, David, I, I haven't seen it today. I don't want to um, stop this. Yes, uh, sorry, teacher, can you hear me? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, my question was, why is the Precambrian so long 
or the time scales is so long compared to the other ones that we know of and the other ones are really detailed and this one not wow. that much information and they are really long yeah well this is a good question david i i think because um again it comes from the historical development of uh, uh, the geological science what happens is that of course these di divisions are created by us by humans yeah and are uh, created by by um uh various kind of uh, indicators so let's say the the eon that we call phanerozoic this was so much divided by the apparition of life and the existence of different types of fossils and the evolution of life with in during this time and uh, what happens is the various researchers they were um you know using the stratigraphy as correlations in the in different parts of europe because in europe it is where they the first geologists modern geologists uh, made their observations in uh england and on mainland europe and what happens is that you can imagine they started with the cambrian because they are seeing these um uh, organisms like trilobites yeah in the cambrian in paleozoic and they, would, they were finding them, let's say, in a certain sedimentary layer, uh, like a shale, let's say. And they find this here, and uh, let's say it's a, a somewhere in the UK. And then they go to B Belgium, and they find a layer which is similar with the same organism. So they said, okay, we call this Cambrian. This is where we start seeing fossils. And then we see uh, more fossils or more advanced or more or different and so on. So they had all these divisions, yeah, based on the apparition of, of these different species and whatever families and with, with all this um, uh, classification and with very fine correlations between the different layers sedimentary layers in europe and the precambrian initially was considered to be whatever it's the time before the apparition of life for them that was it of course life appeared much longer time ago like uh, we are talking about uh, bacteria yeah bacteria which are in the archaean so life on earth is much older but initially the geologists were not seeing that yeah they were just seeing the fossils that are microscopic and so on so they were not realizing this so that they said okay precambrian it's it's crystalline rocks so basically gneisses uh, granitoids ah what can we do with them? Yeah, nothing interesting. They don't have fossils and so on. So it is a bias because initially geology was developed in terms of sedimentary geology. Yeah? Sedimentary layers, people were making a lot of sense out of what they were saying in sedimentary layers. They were not understanding too much from the crystalline domain, metamorphic and igneous. So that is the reason, uh, David. And then with the discovery, yeah, and um, the geological development on our continents, they tried to correlate what they saw in North America with what they see in Europe, the various layers and so on. So they are very much focused on this time period. And that's why they, there are so many divisions based on the evolution of the of life yeah, and the branching of different, uh, the apparition of different uh, species yeah, of different types of organisms. Let's... Uh, yeah, all right, so now to, to come back to the Archean. Um, as you can see, I, I'm going a bit through the text because I say this has been a subject. It's a long standing debate, which still is today, regarding the processes that were active in this time period. Um, and it is a major problem how the, the continental crust has been growing, through what processes. And when modern style plate tectonics started, it's a big debate. It's not settled. There are people who said, oh, it started very early, like at the beginning of Archean. And there are people who say, no, no, no. In Precambrian, we don't have plate tectonics. It's so black and white. Yeah, it goes to the extremes. And uh, there are the reason for this is because the rock record of the Precambrian is so fundamental, and especially of the Archean is so fundamentally different from what we see in younger times from Proterozoic and in Phanerozoic. All right, so now in the Archean, most of the rocks that we see 
are from the late period of the Archean. That means 2.7, 2.5 billion years. So a lot of crust has been forming at that time. Yeah, so we have a, a relatively uh, 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 limited record of uh, older uh, older crust. All right. Now, um, what happens is that if you are thinking in terms of oceanic crust, continental crust, we, we in the Archean re rock record, we don't have evidence, clear evidence of oceanic crust. <laughs> so that's that's interesting, huh? So uh, basically, of course, we can uh, you can imagine that the continental crust is like something that was distilled out of the mantle, yeah? It, it's like some elements preferentially were separated from the mantle and you have this silicic aluminum rich, uh, rich crust as opposed to the mantle, which is magnesium and iron rich, yeah? So you have this separation and the processes that, that led to this separation were always plate tectonics, the formation of, uh, of course, you might say, okay, if you have subduction, the age of the oceanic crust is only 200 million years. Of course, you are not going to have uh, oceanic crust from the Archean, but we don't find ophiolites. Like we don't find those livers that are caught up in the sutures. Yeah, we did, that's why we discussed about the anatomy of the origin so that we can look back in time and we don't see the evidence for this. Where are the sutures? What happened then? So le let me go a bit. I'll show you many interesting things. So let's travel first to Australia, to Western Australia. You see Western Australia. I'm gonna show you two things from Oster Western Australia. One is the Ilgarn Craton. Yeah, Ilgarn Craton is uh, Archean in age. It's divided into some uh, terrains yeah, because people now, some geologists want to, to, do some, to, to do the interpretation of Archean geology of archaean geology in terms of plate tectonics, and they see uh, accretion of terrains as, is, as if we have an accretion erosion. There is no evidence for that actually, but the, there are some geologists who push this model, push this model. So that's why you see the spelling terrain as opposed to terrain. If it were after me, I would say terrain, yeah, because it's a div, it's a distinct piece of the crust with certain characteristics from the other pieces but I'm not so sure about how they came together. Or anyway, here, as you can see, you have a lot of what's called granite gneiss. And remember this terrain, narrow terrain, yeah? Uh, it's a gneissic terrain, a gne uh, the dominant rock is a gneiss. And uh, here you have in green, something that's called greenstone belts. So the, these are rocks like green schists, green schists. Uh, they are metavolcanic, old volcanic rocks like basalts that were a bit metamorphosed to green schist facies. But anyway, narrow terrain, why is it important? You'll, you'll remember this as a geoscientist, it is very important to know about the narrow terrain. It, it's because here, the oldest minerals that were found on Earth that belong to our planet were found here. This is where they found zircons. Zircon is a mineral um, of the uh, element zirconium. It's a silicate of zirconium, and they are very resistant. And the zircons yeah, are used actually for the um, dating method based on uranium lead. So the dating labs using this method, they find, they look for the zircons. Now these zircons, Imagine in this narrow terrain of the Ilgarn Craton, there are this, this region called Jack Hills. You see it here in ABC, yeah? And you see what the rock looks like. So it's a sedimentary rock, yeah? It's a quartzite sediment. And in this sedimentary rock, they found these zircons and they dated them. And it's the oldest mineral that belongs to the planet and it was found on the planet. As you can see, it's Hadean in age, 4.3 billion years. Now, it tells us a story that comes back to the very good question of Gabriel. What happened then? What happened with the rock record from the Hadean? Think about this thing. These zircons crystallized from a melt, from a magma. They crystallized at 4.3, 4.3 4 
billionaires in an igneous rock. Now we find these zircons in a sedimentary rock. What it means is that the igneous rock was eroded by the erosional agents. So, and the zircons traveled into a sedimentary basin and they got sedimented along with these pieces that you see in these figures and they got there. So they are not in a rock that is as old, but the mineral, when it crystallized, it was formed in a pre-existing rock. So thank you, Gabriel, for asking that. I, I, that's why I'm saying it's a very good question. I'm, I'm glad that you, uh, you like uh, asking questions because that means that you uh, like, you know, answering, uh, getting answers. And this is a, a challenge for all of us. And you can bring contributions, in my opinion, in the future as geoscientists to our understanding. So that's very interesting. So this is a very important place because of this reason. We have the oldest minerals. Now, you know, we talk about minerals and then we talk about rocks as aggregates of minerals. So now let's look where we find the oldest rocks. Yeah, we just found pieces of a very old rock that no longer exists. Okay, so we travel now to North America and traveling to North America, as you can see, what I was showing at the North American Craton, you can see it can be divided into many, many things and you see them colored, but in the boring color, which is gray, and where you see uh, these names like Slave, Ray, uh, Superior, Sask, Wyoming, all these are the parts of the Craton which are Archean in age. So the rocks here were formed before 2.5 billion years. And all these that you see in color are additions in the Proterozoic, in the Proterozoic. So you see, basically many of them are orogens. So these are orogens that link, stitch together the pieces, the Archean age microcontinents, if you want. So, and these orogenic belts, they link them together. It's like we had collisions there, yeah? I mentioned to you a very famous one called Granville. You see, Granville is very recent in terms of when we look at these rocks. It's just 1.3 to 1. billion years old. Granville origin was what the Himalayas are today, but at that time, yeah, 1 billion years back. So imagine we are looking at the roots of mountains like the Himalayas now in, uh, when we look at the Granville rocks. And as you can see, Parallel to the Granville, we have the Paleozoic origin, the um, Appalachian yeah, origin that connects to the Caledonites in Europe and so on. So obviously here we might have the story of oceanic basins uh, opening and closing and forming these orogenic belts that were added and led to the increase of the continent, of the continental mass. But let's go, go back to the Archean. Yeah? So you see the Archean ones. And from here, two are very famous. One is called the Slave, uh, the Slave Province, and the, the other one is the Superior Province, which is the largest block of Archean crust, Archean Age crust on Earth. Very rich, very rich, both of them in mineral resources. Uh, uh, the Superior Province, extremely rich in, in gold. Slave Province, very famous for diamonds, also gold. Now, um, as you can see, this is another image. What, what is different from here, I was showing here the Craton. Now here you can see what is exposed out of the Craton is only this that you see here in, with this red and uh, purple color. So this is a superior province exposed. This is a slave province, the part that is exposed. What you see in pink, these are the platforms, yeah? So the craton continuous at depth, on top of it, you have younger sedimentary layers, yeah? So on the sides, on the sides, as I said, of this uh, Archean age microcontinents, you have proterozoic origins. One of them, I'm gonna tell you about it, it's called the Upme origin here. Uh, the other one is called the Trans Hudson. Uh, the other one is Granville, I already mentioned. Now. The uh, Trans Hudson and Loop Mate, they give us indications of 
classic orogenic belts or orogenic belts that formed through the processes that we understand today, but they are Proterozoic in age. They are not Archean. So that's why Archean geology is such a challenge. All right, so let's go to Slave Province. So Slave Province is here. It is in Canada. Its uh, territory is called the Northwest Territory, and part of it goes into Nunavut, uh, which is a territory of, uh, inhabited by the Eskimos, the Inuits. They are about 50,000 uh, in number, not many of them. Um, and here you see the Slave Province, and you see how the Slave Province is block of Archean age crust. It is surrounded by Proterozoic age orogenic belts like the Ubme orogen and here the Phelon and Talston orogen here. And this is another Archean age block and another Archean age block. And here you have Paleozoic sedimentary rocks coming on top of this old Precambrian rock. So this is a platform. Yeah. So this is part of the platform. So very interesting. Slave Province is very famous for uh, diamond deposits because it's a very thick piece of continental lithosphere going down to 200 kilometers or more. So you have the conditions for the formation of the diamonds at depth there. Only in the mantle roots uh, of the cratons are these diamonds formed. All right. Now, what is so special about the slave province? You see it here. Sorry. Yes. Um, could we see again the last, the last slide? Sure. Why do uh, Why do you say that this piece of of Creighton um, has <clears throat> hundred kilometers depth? As I, as we know that. Uh, 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 in promedio, I don't know how to say it. <clears throat> the court, the, the, the crust yes, is, is one is one hundred is one hundred uh, thick, one hundred kilometers thick in thick. The lithosphere. The, uh, no, okay. but in, in the case of the cratons, so these very old parts. That that's another very important aspect. The very old parts of the uh, continents, the Archean age parts of the continents are the thickest parts of the plates yeah so basically the uh, the thickness of the crust plus the lithospheric mantle is very big it's not the usual one these are the uh, this is what happens these are the oldest and also thickest part of the uh, of the lithosphere and it, it goes beyond it goes to 200 yeah, kilometers even more yes the relation between the the oceanic crust and the continental crust is eight times. Oh yeah, but we talk about modern crust. We talk about the modern crust. We are looking at the at the, at the very old uh, rock record we, where we don't. That's the challenge. That's why I'm trying to present to you. It's very important to understand that we are looking at things that are completely different from what we saw in the modern style uh, of tectonics so I, I it's normal for you to ask questions and we wonder why but you have to think about this we we introduced the concept of tectonic plates and so on but of course as a standard and so on but here it's a piece of crust which is very old uh, very thick and the 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 little like similarly and very cold so the idea is here, the heat flow is very low, actually. And um, so it's a piece of, of uh, uh, you know, the top part of the, of the lithosphere that was formed a very long time ago. And actually, we don't know exactly through what processes. That's one of the questions it was formed. But it is what it is. It is that the thickest parts of the uh, lithosphere are in this very old uh, parts of the Kratons. <laughs> yes. Thank you, yeah. teacher. Yeah, you're welcome. So, um, as you can see, what you see here is a typical Archean terrain. A typical Archean terrain, if you look at the legend here, you will see we think it says Archean granitoid rocks. And we've read it says Archean basement gneisses. That's a big debate if this gneisses, uh, and uh, sorry, I'll tell you. And with green, you see Archean metavolcanic. Metavolcanic 
meta means metamorphosed, yeah? So metavolcanic means volcanic rocks that were metamorphosed, dominantly basalts. So metavolcanic rocks and uh, this gneisses. The question is, some people say, okay, the gneisses were the uh, basement to the volcanic rocks. Some people say this, other people say, well, we don't have clear evidence for that because everything was invaded by these huge plutons that you see in pink here. Okay, so Archean geology sh will show you, I'll, I'll, I'll explain in the text uh, in a bit, but we'll show you this division. Now, in the slave province, yeah, in the slave province, you can read this text. Uh, you see basically how old the crust is and so on. Um, but anyway, how big it is, like about 680 kilometers by uh, 460 and so on. And it tells you that it, it is surrounded by, uh, you know, uh, proterozoic rocks and so on. But I want you to have to, to focus on this part that you see in red here. These are Archean basement gneisses. They are very famous. And the name is Acasta. Yeah. Uh, Acasta, uh, as you can see the word here, uh, where it's in yellow here. So basically, this is a paper you see was published in 1999. Priscoan is a name similar to Hadean. So it's a it's synonym. You can say Priscoan or Hadean. In most cases, you'll see Hadean. Um, but some people use Priscoan, yeah? So these people uh, published this paper and they say, okay, we dated, we dated zircons from this gneisis that we call Acasta gneisis. They are in the western part of the slave province in Canada. And what they found was that these rocks are older than the in uh, initiation of the Archean Eon. So they are Hadean. What is the, the most important thing about these rocks is that they are the oldest rocks that we have found so far on Earth. There is no other place on Earth where we found all the rocks. So when we talk about rocks, that means that the rock itself, yeah, was formed then not only a certain mineral. That's the idea. These are igneous rocks that got a bit metamorphosed, more or less, uh, some more, some less, but the idea is they are very complex. As nice as I'm gonna show you what, what they look like. But if you ever hear about acastagnisis, so if you hear about acastagnisis, they are the oldest rocks on earth. If you hear about Jack Hills in the Naria terrain in Australia, the oldest minerals, 4.3 on earth. Okay, so that's why we started the story of this, to, for you to know what we have. And here is basically, if you were to look at the rock, you see how different phases in this gneiss are. are. So you, you see quartz diuretic gneiss, hornblendite, granitic gneiss, pegmatite, coarse grain gra ground uh, diuretic gneiss. So you can see different phases, yeah? So what is in interesting, people have been, uh, have been uh, sampling the, this uh, Acasta gneisses and they have been publishing papers up to, they, they, they got to show that actually the rocks were formed at 4.2 billion years. Now a bit of translation here, it says granite, granitoids and diorites with granitic protoliths indicated as 4.2 billion years. What this means, it means that you see the rock today as a gneiss because it was metamorphosed. So it suffered transformation and some recrystallization due to metamorphism. But the initial rock is called a protolith. You will learn this with Marcos in, in petrology. So the protolith, proto means old, lit, comes from lithos, from rock. The old rock was a, gra a granitoid, a gra granite. The zircon crystallized in that, and the whole rock was metamorphosed, yeah? But the rock stayed there. It was not like in, in Australia, the zircon was eroded and traveled somewhere else, yeah? So these are the oldest rocks that we know of uh, on Earth. And if you were to travel there, they would look something like this. This is an outcrop of the Acasta Gneiss complex. So people would be, would be sampling this to get the dates, yeah? So you see what they look like, very interesting. 
But now coming back to da David's question, yeah, people in Europe, initially they were stratigraphers, for instance. So they, when they would see gnises, they would not be interested. They would say, okay, I'm not interested in these rocks. It's not gonna have fossils. Yeah, so that's the idea. All right, now, here is a bit of text. You don't have to read it now, it's for you because I took it from a book, as you can see. I, I took it from a book, but it explains to you the essence of Archean geology. So basically what it says is that in the Archean cratons around the world, you will have, as you can see, two broad groups of rocks, two. One is called greenstone belts that were with green on the maps I've shown you in Australia and in Slave Province, and one called high-grade gneiss. So high-grade gneiss were like the narrier terrain gneiss or the Acasta gneisses. They are high grade because they were metamorphosed in a higher grade facies, like amphibolite facies or granulite facies. So these rocks together are called, um, okay, so greenstone belts and high grade gneiss. And there is a big discussion if these gneisses formed initially the basement to the basalts that form the greenstone belts. There is a whole discussion because when they come into contact, they don't see a stratigraphic contact. They see a tectonic contact. So the question is, okay, tectonic contact means the formation brought these ro rock packages together. We cannot say for sure what the rela initial relationship between them was, okay? So this is one thing. Now, the, all these uh, uh, two types of rocks were invaded by granitoid plutons, yeah? And that's why when you see this pink with green on the maps, they are called granite greenstone belts. Yeah, these regions of these old volcanic rocks invaded by granitoids, and they are called granite greenstone belts. Now, you can read about the greenstone uh, belts, what they contain, old volcanic and some sedimentary rocks, how they were metamorphosed at low temperatures. This is low in geology, okay? They were less than 500 as opposed to, and you see, it says dark green color because they are ferromagnesian, yeah? They are basalts, most of them. And the metamorphism converted some of the minerals to chloride, actinolite, epidote, but still green minerals, yeah? Now, the high-grade nice are the old granitoids that were metamorphosed at high temperature. That's why it's high-grade. And they look like the acasta gneisses, as I have shown you. So you can see uh, they have a composition of granodiorite, tonalite. You'll learn with Marcos all these rocks, what they, they mean. But granodiorite is very common, yeah? As a tonalite is very specific to the Archean. It has more uh, feldspar plagioclase. It's like a granodiorite, but more feldspar uh, plagioclase. All right, so you can uh, read about this. Um, and the these intrusions, this material that intruded, these granitoids that intruded these initial terrains, they come in terms, pathologically speaking, that they come in a series that is called tonalite, trongemite, granodiorite. And you'll, you'll find in the literature PTG, very specific to the Archean eon, very specific, okay? So that's why we are looking at things that are, are different from what we see today. That's why it's so interesting. All right, I'm gonna show you. This is an example of metavolcanic rocks from a greenstone belt. This is from Ontario, from the Superior Province. And they are called pillow basalts. And pillow basalts, you see these ovoids here, yeah? And they are like pillows, yeah, pillows because these are basalts that were forming underwater. And underwater, the, it's this difference in temperature, cold, cold water and hot, um, hot basaltic lava. And the lava, when it comes into contact with water, takes the form of a pillow, yeah? It forms like this and like this and like this, and it forms these pillows. So this, we know, it's a pillow basalt formed underwater. And this is a typical rock of the greenstone belts. That's what you see. 
All right. So uh, now to show you the other one, high grade gneiss, similar to the Acasta gneiss, similar. This comes from Africa, from the Limpopo gneiss complex in South Africa. So here uh, it is at the, at the boundary between the Kabval Craton and the uh, Zimbabwe Craton. And you can see here why we discussed structural geology. These rocks suffered plastic deformation. They flowed. It's amazing when you look at this, you, you just can't believe how was this possible, yeah? This is high grade gneiss. So, and migmatite is a high grade gneiss that had locally melting of the material and recrystallization. So it looks like these parts here that you see in white here, these are migmatites. These are like, like a, a, a partial melting of the rock at high temperature and recrystallization, yeah? So very typical. So these are the rocks, the two rock types uh, that are very old and we, we, we discuss about them a lot. All right, so now I'm gonna tell you a bit of tectonics. So basically why is so uh, such a big controversy is that the, you see the structural style, which is exclusive to the Archean cratons, is what's called the dome, dome and keel. If you know the, the sailing boats, yeah, the sailing boats, you see the boat, but if you were to look below the boat, it has a part which goes into the water uh, very deep, which is called keel because the sailing boat will dip like this, yeah, because of the wind, and, but it doesn't turn over. Yeah, it doesn't turn over because it has this keel in the water that counterbalances. So in the same way, we have domes and the domes are granitoidic, plut uh, granitoidic plutons and the keels are these old basalts, the greenstone belts that appear to have sunk between these domes of granitic composition lava, uh, magma. So the Archean tectonics is so controversial because many people see evidence of what's called vertical tectonics. Imagine that the basalts were deposited on top of a granitic crust. The basalts are thick. They are gonna be like an insulator. The granitoids contain uh, radioactive minerals, so the heat increases. They become soft. They they start to rise because of their buoyancy. And the basalts are heavy, and they start to think to to sink in between the rising domes of uh, granite. So this is a very different tectonic style from what we discussed so far. Yeah, I have never mentioned to you anything like this. But we see this. So what was happening on, on the planet at the time? So that's why we traveled to uh, Australia again. Uh, and you see here again in Western Australia, but not in Ilgarn, we go to Pilbara, where you see you see the Indian Ocean here. And this is another famous Archean Age Craton, Pilbara Craton. And you can see very nicely here the, the domes, all these domes, yeah? and you see the, their names. Yeah, ME is Mount Edgar Dome, for instance. Yeah, CD, Corona Downs Dome, Show Dome. And in between are these greenstone belts of basalts, predominantly basalts, that kind of uh, appear to have sunk in between these domes. Yeah. So you can read about this. You can read about this. But anyway, I'm going to show you uh, so this image as a satellite image so that you, you can see. So this is a show battle. Yeah, you see the show that bat here. So this is a show battle. Um, this Corona Downs battle. Yeah, uh, Mount Edgar battle. And in between, yeah, you see greenstones. Yeah, greenstone uh, belts. So this is basically the idea that inspires this model of vertical tectonic models, where we have a density inversion that leads to the sinking of, of the dense heavy rocks and the uprising of the soft light rocks, which are the basalts, all right? And this comes to compete with the ideas of plate tectonics, which 
basically plate tectonic is based is a model based on the rigidity of the lithospheric plates they must have must be rigid so that the deformation is only at the margins and then you have subduction and one part can go down but only if it's rigid can go down and so on and here we see evidence of crust a soft crust yeah something else was happening so very interesting okay now we we will come back to this in the next lecture don't worry what i want to say is we have the archean and now david was asking me why here we have this kind of clear divisions hadean archean uh proterozoic well archean they, uh, david is if you want this time period where we see this type of geology that i was showing you and now we move into proterozoic a very long eon yeah the longest one two billion years and in proterozoic we start seeing things that are different that make the transition to our present reality now here in the proterozoic terrains of the cratons we have two major groups of rocks geologically speaking yeah one you see it says thick sequences of sedimentary and volcanic rocks weakly deformed and metamorphosed that were deposited in large basins so you already had the archean continents on top of the archean continents you have this sedimentation and here is something important i, I I'll, uh, I'll i'll point out to you it says most common mythology here is quartzite carbonate shale intercalated with banded iron formation charts charts are like silica yeah it's silica um, uh, so basically it's like quartz but it is uh basically uh, very fine grained charts volcanic uh, rocks can reach thicknesses of up to 10 kilometers okay so basically what this the preservation of these uh, successions of sedimentary rocks the, it tells us that the archean parts of the continents today the archean parts were already stable at that time and nothing happened in terms of the formation since then yeah we had these sedimentary rocks they were not deformed they were preserved since then so very interesting that we had these parts very old stable kind of dead since then now the second group is what i was showing you orogenic belts that indicate collisions between the archean continents yeah the uh, proterozoic age orogenic belts so here we can we can find evidence of fold and thrust belts so we discussed about fold and thrust like in the phanerozoic and then we we have belts of hydrognosis like the interior part of the origins uh in, in high grade means amphibolite granulite facies zones of uh ductile thrust zones so and also some evidence of ophiolites so people start having more confidence that maybe plate tectonics as we know it was operating in the pro in the proterozoic but we don't have the evidence for it in the archean yeah that's interesting so let me show you so what you see here you see it says this uh gray the kind of uh, darker gray is our exposures of archean and early proterozoic crust but then the light gray you see selected exposures of early proterozoic and middle proterozoic crust and these are or, uh, these are proterozoic orogenic belts in in black so you see the numbers here are here different origins different proterozoic age origins you see how many of them i have uh, they they show here 19 so a lot of orogenic belts if you will of it now I'm going to show you something from here on the side of the superior province. I'm going to show you the Ubme origin. But first, I want to show you this. This is the banded iron formation. I was saying that in these sedimentary basins uh, on Archean crust in Proterozoic, you get banded iron formations. Now think about this. They were formed. So what you see, you see these layers of 
an iron oxide, which is uh, magnetite, and chert, silica. So these successions of chert, iron oxide, chert, iron oxide. Now, these are a major source of iron today. So deposits of iron. But you see, they formed between the vast majority of them, between 1.8 to 2.5 billion years so. old. Why, one of you are, is going to ask me, why only then? Well, they are very important geologically. Now, you, in this lecture, you learn a lot of things. They are important geologically because they are the record of the oxygenation of the planet. The atmosphere of the planet didn't have the oxygen amount that we have today. The oxygen was created by the cyanobacteria. Yeah. And in this period of time, there was a massive addition of oxygen. And what happens, iron in a in a, in an environment without oxygen, iron was soluble in the oceans. But when the oxygen uh, concentration started to increase iron precipitated. So these rocks show us the time when the oxygen was put into our atmosphere. So basically, they are very important witnesses of this important moment in uh, the time of our planet. All right, so very, very important, very interesting. Now, I'm, I was promising to show you the uh, Paleoproterozoic Ubmay origin. So here is a slave province, yeah? Uh, not far from here are the Acasta Gnisis. And here, if you look, this is the origin. And what you can see, you see this name, fold and thrust belt, yeah? Fold belt, fold and thrust belt. And then you see a metamorphic plutonic belt and the magmatic zone. So this starts being a bit similar to what I was showing you in an origin today. And if you look at the cross section, indeed, so you can see something that's called like a thrust belt, passive margin sequence, and ophiolite shown here, potential ophiolite, yeah, this is an interpretation. But obviously, we start seeing an anatomy that starts to be more or less getting closer to what we see today. So now we start thinking, okay, maybe we start witnessing processes that might be similar to the ones that operate today. But before this, we don't have the evidence for that. All right, so this is proterozoic. And here, I'm gonna end this with, uh, you see here a lot of text, but I leave it for you to read in detail. Uh, I'm gonna show you three diagrams. One is, if you ever thought about the fact that tectonics is the result, the dynamics of our planet is the result of the balance between heat production and heat loss. Yeah, because this is a balance that makes things move. And look at some uh, models of what the what the heat loss today is, is one and everything is normalized to the heat loss today that you see. Here. So what you see here is that the heat production and the heat production within the planet comes from the radioactive elements. Now, there is a limited number, yeah? So as you know, they decay, they decay, they decay. But the heat production has been decreasing with time. There was a moment in time, and you see it here, you see uh, somewhere older than three billion years, between three and 3.5 billion years, there was a, a moment in time when the heat production was more than the heat loss. So basically the idea is, okay, the planet was getting warmer and warmer because it was not getting rid of the heat. But then obviously when it starts being more efficient and it gets rid of the heat and you, you lose more heat than you produce, obviously you must have an evolution in the dynamics. This is what we call secular change. It's not a flat situation. So secular change means if these parameters change, then obviously something in the dynamics has been changing. Obviously the processes that we see today 
are not necessarily the processes that existed then, because our process might be more efficient to drive this balance between heat loss and heat production. So you can see from the way I argue, I tend, I, I, I am not a uniformitarian. I'm not an extreme uniformitarian to say, well, what is today has been the same all the time. Look at everything in nature. Look at our bodies. We, we get old. We are young. We go through middle age and we get old. We transform and everything in nature transforms. And the, our planet and the way our planet, like in the same way the metabolism of our bodies changes from a young child to an old person, in the same way, everything in nature changes. So we cannot be uniformitarianists, uh, uniformitarianists to the extreme, like some people like to be. All right. So here is something for you to to uh, read, and here is to show you that the model suggests that the uh, crustal geotherms changed through time. So obviously, you see, at 3.5 billion years old, it was warmer at any depth yeah, compared to today. So we had this cooling of the planet, which is normal. And the cooling today happens through what? It happens through plate tectonics, yeah, plate tectonics, and through conduction and through advection. And advection is what the, the melts, yeah, the magma rises as it rises from the, um, from the mantle into the crust, it carries heat with it, yeah? So we have these processes and, and actually the question is what was the balance between this process? What was more efficient when things were hotter? Yeah. So you see some arguments, mechanical arguments and physical arguments, higher geothermal gradients will weaken the crust. So the crust will be weaker. So obviously we are gonna see those rocks that flowed and suffered plastic deformation. You see 800 degrees at the Moho is quite a lot. Think about the fact that, of course, the basaltic composition rocks would melt at 1200 degrees. The granitic ones at 600. Now 800 is a lot. So obviously you, you can imagine that. So we have thermal weakening of the mantle. Yeah. So the question is the mantle would support thick crust or it wouldn't. And then the, the, the question is, if the crust itself is weak, we don't have strong lithosphere. If we don't have strong lithosphere, how is it, what, where is the deformation? Only at, at some planes that deform here or they all deform. And then how do you sustain subduction? Because you're not gonna have something rigid going like this if everything is weak. Yeah, so obviously we have to, to understand from a very limited rock record and accept that physical processes were adapted to the parameters that existed at the time. Yeah? And here is another uh, aspect that uh, I want you to think a bit about it, the, gr the rate of continental growth. Yeah? So it's, there is this idea that the continental crust has been forming with time. Yeah? We didn't have from the beginning all the continental crust because it's this separation, geochemical separation from the mantle. And basically there are models, as you can see, in terms of the rate of growth, when the rate of growth was larger and when it's more. Now today it's more, yeah? You can see that in the Archean, we had uh, the most severe rate of growth. And you see basically the change in time of the growth rate. And this itself will suggest to us that we must have, have, have had secular changes in the processes, in the tectonic process that are responsible for the formation and growth of continental crust. And you can see here, these are basically um, the, um, the supercontinent events that you remember we discussed, you see, Rodinia, Nuna, Kenora, Kenora land can, comes from the uh, city of Kenora in uh, Western Ontario in Canada. So because the Superior Province is such an important part of our Kian, uh crust, Kenora land, we have the evidence that at 2.7 uh, billion years, we had a major 
major event of continental crust formation and growth. Yeah, so, and what this histogram shows, this, uh, this basically shows zircons from juvenile granitoid rocks. And you see, basically, you have peaks in these zircons. You have peaks at the moment of this supercontinent formation. That means that a lot of these rocks were formed and they carried the zircons and we can date the zircons. All right, so I'm gonna end now. This is it uh, for today. I thank you and I'm glad you've been here uh, with me today. And I hope you find this part of the history of our planet that's really interesting. Yeah. And maybe some of you will work in, uh, in the uh, old trains. You are welcome, Gabriel. Yeah, so have a good uh, afternoon. I'm going to see you on Thursday. We'll continue a bit the story. All right. So. Teacher, may I ask you a quick question? Definitely, David. Uh, I still couldn't understand why the via the uh, bended iron formations were a change between red, black, red, black. I understand oh, that the bended iron formations with oxygen. Uh, so, so why they were red and well, the the succession why these things is that this process of um, precipitation of iron was not like a, a process that happened all at once boom yeah so because the oxygen in the atmosphere has been growing in that time period uh not suddenly from zero to now to what we have today so it, 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 there there was a, a growth in concentration so you can imagine the the um, oxygenation of the ocean could happen and initially could basically lead to the precipitation of some iron. And then you have chemical precipitation of silica, which is chert, like the formation of chert in a sedimentary basin. And then maybe more oxygen is added and even more iron is precipitated, okay. more oxygen is added. So we have this basically uh alternance because of this it was not now i'm giving you an answer which is not complete david for the reason that this is a matter of research of current research why we have this alternance exactly and how this process was going on yeah so we don't have a final answer for that okay thank you teacher uh, you are welcome david but one thing just to tell you we have more questions than answers for this time period in our Earth's uh, history. Okay, yes, I understand now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. You are very day. welcome. Yeah, very welcome. Uh, have a good day, uh, all of you. Davidi, Davidi, Ivani, Camila. Yeah, you are welcome. David, are you okay? How are you doing? Maybe you cannot hear me. All right. So 